Hi, I'm Larry Johnson. I am a professor at Texas A&M University uh, in the Department of Veterinary Integrated Biosciences. We want to continue with our histology uh, uh, lectures, and today we're going to talk about the liver, the gallbladder, pancreas, and the salivary glands. These are organs and glands associated with the digestive system and indeed are the accessory components uh, of the digestive system. We want to look at the general organization of these organs and glands and to figure out how they contribute uh, to uh, obtaining metabolites uh, for the body, uh, for growth and energy for movement, uh, as well as uh, help maintain the normal milieu of the body. We want to look at the origin of these, of these cells and structures uh, and uh, look about the function of how uh, they contribute to uh, absorption of food stuff. If we look at the digestive tract through here, we see the oral cavity, and through there, we got the esophagus, the stomach, uh, the small intestine, large intestines. And today, we're looking at the salivary glands that contribute uh, to the digestive system here. And then we have the liver, the pancreas coming in, and the small intestines where they dump into there uh, uh, in terms of of uh, their contribution to the digestive. Now, the digestive system does three important things. One, it moves food, it secretes digestive juices, and it absorbs in of food stuff. The role of the liver, gallbladder, salivary glands, and pancreas, uh, in terms of movement of food, uh, they lubricate the glands, uh, lubricate the food stuff coming down. Uh, in terms of digestion, the salivary gland, pancreas, that secrete digestive juices, and the liver secretes bile, which emulsifies fats. In terms of absorption, liver stores nutrients and cleans the blood. It also, uh, the accessory gland organ contribute to uh, producing the antibodies in the fluids and antibacterial uh, viral growth substances as well. So the origin of the GI tract it largely is the endoderm. That's where the main GI tract comes, the liver, the pancreas, the gastric glands, the intestinal glands, the gallbladder. However, there is some from the oral, uh, oral cavities from the endo ectoderm, and the mesoderm uh, contributes to mesothelium, which lines the serous cavities, which is the outer layer uh, of the gut and outer layer uh, of, of the organs. So if we look at developing uh, digestive tract, uh, we can see the esophagus coming down, salivary glands would be above there. We see the salivary glands and the oral cavity. Uh, and then the stomach, and then uh, out pocketing comes the gallbladder and the liver. Uh, also out pocketing comes the, uh, the pancreas as well. So here we see the liver, it's a, a lobule of the liver with a central vein in the center, gallbladder, salivary glands with the striated ducts. Uh, and the pancreas with the islets of Langerhorn. So here we see uh, the liver, the lungs are up here, pancreas is located here, but here we see the big liver. Uh, and we see a rich vascular supply there in the liver uh, and through there, as is uh, one of the main functions is to, is to clean, clean the blood and also store nutrients uh, between meals to discharge to keep the glucose uh, levels constant. Um, if we look at the liver, uh, we see this in a pig liver. It's very good because they have connective tissue uh, between the lobules. So this is one lobule, another lobule, another lobule that we see here. And in there we see the central vein. The central vein is right in here. And so blood comes in from these portal radicals. The portal radical is composed of the portal vein, uh, of the bile duct, uh, and the hepatic artery. So the blood from the portal vein uh, coming from the GI tract, uh, small intestines mainly, and then uh, the hepatic artery bleeds, gives oxygenated blood in it, and that blood moves over this way, goes through there to the central vein. The bile goes the other way, uh, but the, one of the com three components is the bile duct taking the bile out. Blood goes toward the central vein, bile goes toward the triad that we see there. And so if we look at the liver, it has a capsule for sure, and out through there would be a mesothelium. Uh, here we see the mesothelial cells right here, uh, kind of squamous cells that are located uh, uh, 
in uh, around uh, the liver, uh, and that would be the the cavity outside there. And here we see uh, the classical lobules uh, in the pig, and this has got connective tissue uh, around it, so we can see the individual classical lobules where blood's running from here toward the central vein that we can see. Now, hepatocytes functions both as an endocrine cell because it secretes glucose uh, and plasma proteins, blood uh, clotting factors, for example, and an exocrine because it secretes bile um, and, and in its bile canaliculus, the little projections on the side. So it produces uh, uh, things directly in the blood, like endocrine, and also uh, secretes things in a duct, uh, like the exocrine. So hepatocytes are lined up, as you see there, and so the blood is washed on both sides of the, of the hepatocytes, going from the portal radical toward the central vein. Uh, as a consequence of having uh, both interconnection function, uh, you may have as many as four uh, uh, luminal areas. This is the bile canaliculus here, bile canaliculus there, and then this is a sinus, blood sinus here and here, with a hepatocyte in the middle. Uh, a big nucleus, big nucleolus, uh, a lot of euchromatin, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, a lot of Golgi, fair amount of rough ER for producing proteins, uh, and also also uh, lysosomes that we see. So we can see a electron micrograph of it. We can see uh, the uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum in through there. We can see the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Mitochondria with a tuber type Christi, like steroid secreting cells have, um, because it has all this smooth ER for uh, conjugating uh, uh, enzymes that are necessary to digest things, to detoxify things. Here we see the nucleus uh, with a big, uh, a lot, a lots of euchromatin. Uh, in through there, this is a Kupfer cell or endothelial cell lining uh, the blood sinus. So the function of a liver is the largest organ. It produces bile, bile salts, uh, and it goes out through the bile duct. So the, the endocrine uh, function uh, is albumin, which is important to keeping water in blood uh, and fibrinogen, uh, as well as other uh, blood clotting proteins. So if we list the functions of the liver, uh, we can see filtration of blood. There's a lot of Kupfer cells. Kupfer cells line uh, the uh, blood vessels or blood sinuses, and they are phagocytic. So they take things out of the blood. It also stores uh, blood, and it stores uh, some big sinuses, so it stores blood. Uh, it maintains a normal uh, glucose concentrations. You eat things, things are stored as you're I don't eat, uh, then it breaks down to maintain the glucose level. Metabolism and transport of lipids it does, secretes uh, plasma proteins for blood clotting, uh, nutritional metabolism and bile secretion is what it does. Uh, it, it also drug uh, metabolism, detoxification. Uh, it also uh, produces uh, uh, get rid of uh, bilirubin. Without it, we'd be jaundiced or have yellow blood. Uh, and it secretes bile, which emulsifies fat. So there's a lot of functions uh, that the liver, uh, liver does to help us. As I mentioned before, we have the triad here, which has the uh, portal uh, vein coming from the small intestine, bringing blood uh, there that has uh, nutrients in it and it stores in there as the blood's going to the central vein. But since this is a portal vessel, uh, the blood's already been through a capillary network and it uh, has low oxygen level. So you need to have an artery in through there providing uh, some blood that has oxygen in it to uh, maintain uh, these cells in through there. So uh, these two contribute, these two vessels, artery and vein, contribute blood going to the central vein. Um, and so this is a sinuses in between. Uh, also, we have the bile canaliculus. That is a, a little uh, connection between adjacent cells with a little lumen in through there, and that ultimately goes into the bile duct. Blood goes toward the central vein, bile goes away from the central vein. So here we can see one of those portal radicals. This is the bile duct, simple cuboidal cells, endothelial cells of our artery, 
endothelial cells uh, of the portal vein. Here we see the sinuses in through there, and these would be the, the hepatocytes that we see there. So basically the central vein uh, is in through there. This is a portal radical. That's what this is, portal radical heading toward the central vein. It's out of view there. So going from the portal radical to the central vein is how the blood is going. So again, we can see the by portal radical. There's a vein, <coughs> artery, uh, and the, the bile duct heading to the central vein, which have endothelial cells lining it, but the sinus is empty directly into the central vein, as you see there. Here we can see uh, the blood vessels. This is a, uh, actually, this is the bile uh, duct here, uh, the, the vein uh, and the artery making the triad. There's also other things you're going to have uh, lymphatics in there, and you also have uh, connective tissue, and you have nerves in there as well. A central vein, and we see the hepatocytes uh, that, that we have there. And so uh, this is what we have here. We got the bile duct, artery, and vein that we have there. So this is the bile canaliculus, uh, and we see tight junctions between adjacent cells uh, to allow this lumen to occur. Uh, microvilli project in through there. So this is a way that the bowel goes through. So the, the blood is in the sinuses, but the bowel is in the bowel canaliculus. So it goes between the different cells and then finally it goes into the duct, which has like cuboidal cells. But the first compartment of the pathway is the bowel canaliculus. It's just a space between adjacent hepatocytes, as we can see. So here we can see that space uh, where the bile goes, and then these are the endothelial cells and the Kupfer cells. So the blood will be coming through there, and the bile's going, uh, going that way, as we mentioned before. There are uh, different cells in the lobe. One is a hepatocyte. That's the parenchymal cell of the liver. That's the main cell. Here's this big nucleus, a big nucleolus, and lots of mitochondria. Uh, that we uh, that we see uh, there are the dots that we see. There's also Kupfer cells. Kupfer cells are phagocytic cells or macrophage-like cells. Come from a, uh, from monocytes uh, uh, in the bone marrow, uh, and they help clean the blood. We also have endothelial cells. Endothelial cells lining the uh, lining the uh, the blood vessels, the sinuses as well. So if we look at these, we can see the Kupfer cells are phagocytic. We see the big nucleus here of the hepatocyte, and then we see the endothelial cells uh, next, to the, next to the blood. Now the triad with the bile duct and central vein, we can see that here. Uh, these are the Kupfer cells that are picked up carbon. Uh, this is a triad, which is the, uh, the bile duct uh, artery, and vein that we see, and the uh, this is a central vein that, that's collecting there. So basically, as I said, we have our, a liver lobule uh, with triads around through here, and then uh, the, the blood goes to the central vein to be to be removed. Uh, with the bowel going one way, uh, the going through the bowel canaliculus, and then finally into uh, the duct as it's going toward. And so as a consequence of having this, you have uh, different uh, regions of the, of the liver uh, hepatocyte. Now, if we look at the liver lobule or the classical lobule, as we talked about, triad, source of blood, going to the central vein. <coughs> and so that's the main way that you look at it. But there is certainly the zonation of the liver. Uh, here we see the hepatocytes. Uh, through here, but also the sinuses uh, in between. And we can see the sinusoidal. This is just shows you the blood vessels, how you have anastomosing and uh, reanastomotion so that you have a nice mixing of the blood. With the vein bigger and bigger and an artery in through there, and this would be where the triad would be heading toward uh, the central vein through the sinuses. And here you can see where the sinuses are draining uh, into the central vein. Here we see the central vein here with the, the anastomosis and sinuses going in through there. So this is just a lumen where the blood vessel would be. Uh, 
and, and the space in between there, of course, would be full of hepatocytes. So when we talk about zonation on the liver, we talk about uh, three different ways of looking at the liver. And one is a classical lobule, and that's what we said. We can see that very nice in a pig. There's also a portal lobule with a triad in the center. Since this is a source of blood, it can go to any one of these three central veins. It may not just go there, it's gonna go here and here. So a portal lobule has the, uh, has the triad in the center uh, with three uh, central veins around it. The asinus is a layers uh, between the two central veins. So uh, it's what's between uh, two central veins. This is three central veins, two central veins. And this one is central veins in the middle. So what's in between? And you have a different zone. Zone one is where you have the triad. Then you have zone two and then zone three. So we see the zonation uh, of the liver. Uh, this is the uh, classical lobule. Uh, uh, as we can see, the basic classical lobule we talked about before with a, a triad out here and a central vein in the middle. Uh, if we look at uh, the asinus, we can see there are different zones, zone one, two, uh, and three that we have there. Uh, here we can see zone one, two, and three. If the liver is damaged due to toxin, it kills the hepatocytes in zone one. So it kills those uh, in zone one first. So if you take a chunk of liver from a dead animal and look at it, uh, in zone one is deteriorated. That usually means that some kind of toxic thing has been involved that kills those cells. However, if a liver is damaged due to oxygen de deprivation, that is a toxin that you have, ties up oxygen, not toxic to the cell, just ties up oxygen and deprives the cell, then it will kill zone three. So what kind of toxin you have that kill the animal uh, it will dictate, uh, uh, be able to analyze large groups of toxins uh, here in, in the acid type way of looking at it. Uh, and so here we see the, uh, the, the, the uh, blood vessel as well as hepatocytes and the bowel uh, canaliculus. Hepatocyte has lots of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It also has proxosomes in through there as well. You see the crystalline core in it, single membrane around it. Uh, here's lots of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is uh, uh, involved in the detoxification. It also has a gap junction between adjacent cells for communication. It also stores glycogen as well. Here we can see the gap junctions between adjacent, adjacent cells. So uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of proxosomes in through there, and that's what we're staining for the proxosome that we see in through there. So in addition to uh, uh, having a sinus, you have endothelial cells, and this is incomplete. So they're incomplete. The basal lamina between there is incomplete as well. And so that way the fluid literally bathes the hepatocytes. You don't have this uh, elsewhere in the body. Usually the endothelial cells prevent uh, uh, immediate blood contact with cells, but not so in the liver. Uh, it prevents uh, white blood cells from going through, but the fluid goes through. And in the space between the hepatocyte and the endothelial is a space of these that we can see here. We see the space of these. This is a hepatocyte. See the refiar, mitochondria. These are the endothelial cells, and this is a sinus lumen, as we can see. So again, space of these right in through there. Uh, right in through there is a space of these. Uh, there's a biocanaliculus. Uh, adjacent cells are attached to one another. Mitochondria that, that we can see endothelial cells aligning that sinus. So in terms of sugar and protein, uh, you see glucose goes in, stored as glycogen, or is broken down uh, and released as glucose. So when you, you're uh, digesting the food uh, stuff, uh, glucose is taken in and stored, uh, and then uh, it, it's distributed slowly uh, uh, whenever you're fasting in between. Amino acids come in here, uh, and the rough enterprise in particular produce albumin, uh, fibrinogen, prothrombin, lipoproteins, uh, different things that are, that are produced. And so uh, sugars and proteins are produced there. And here we can see, 
here's a liver that we have right here. And so from the portal vein, you have a certain amount of sugar coming in. Uh, and then uh, you've got uh, all this uh, uh, glycogen storage. And then you have a little bit of sugar uh, coming, uh, coming out of it as it's stored in through there. Uh, <clears throat> and then here's a pancreas. Pancreas is producing uh, insulin. Uh, to uh, cause uh, cells to pick up glucose, so it's important in the liver to pick up uh, glucose and stores glycogen, also store glycogen in muscle as well with very little sugar, almost no sugar coming out in the urine. You don't want to lose the sugar that you have. Here we see cells that are stained for uh, carbohydrates, and you can see that, there, that this is a given cell, there's this nucleus, there's a nucleolus, and all these globule things here are the glycogen stored. If you had a two-hour fast, you have 8% of the cell is composed of glycogen, as you can see, the dark here. In contrast, 24-hour fast, you have less than 1% uh, uh, glycogen. So in other words, there's a breakdown of the glycogen from these cells over a period of fasting, and that's how it maintains uh, the normal uh, glucose levels during the uh, in between the eating process. So uh, bile salts are also absorbed uh, from the small intestine. Remember that uh, uh, the digestive uh, system bile is dumped in there. Bile salts comes back through uh, through the blood vessels and then is reabsorbed up here. And also you synthesize others. Ninety percent of the bile salts are recycled. So you just have a recycling. So the bile dumped out, stored in the gallbladder, goes into the small intestine, then reabsorbed back into the blood, and then these hepatocytes put it back into the bile. Is what, but some of it is synthesized. Uh, and you have uh, the conjugation uh, capability uh, in the smooth and the reticulum to be able to produce those. So 90% is recycled there. Uh, disease opportunity for each step in the pathway. So there are different steps in the pathway into making the bowel. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see uh, that in each one of these steps, there's a disease associated uh, with them. Don't worry about the diseases now. Just to say that when there's various steps, there's opportunity for disease for something to go wrong in that step. So we can see the different ones associated with the different steps. So, uh, in addition to that, uh, antibodies. Antibodies are passed through those cells, uh, endothelial cells, going into the lumen. Uh, transcytosis is what uh, we call that. Uh, and so, uh, in the bile, you would have antibodies associated with that. So, transcytosis is where, where uh, something produced from one membrane to another membrane, in this case, all the way across. Uh, from the base uh, to the lumen of that vessel. Uh, Biocanaliculus, uh, four plus components are there. One is, is cholesterol, that's how we get rid of cholesterol. Uh, EGF, insulin, uh, IgA uh, is a secretory type antibodies that produce also bile salts and bilirubin. That's how we get rid of the bilirubin. Bilirubin is from the breakdown of the red blood cells. Uh, the hemoglobin and the red blood cells. So if we look at the liver, we see these uh, cords of uh, hepatocytes with the biocanaliculus in between, access to the lumen on either side uh, of the blood vessels. Uh, we have the bile duct bringing bile out. Uh, we have the artery bleeding oxidated blood. We have portal vein bleeding bringing the nutrient-rich blood in through there. So the biocanaliculus gives rise to the bile duct as we can see right there. The bile duct right in through there going to. And here we can see the biocanaliculus is just everywhere. All the hepatocytes have to have it because uh, they secrete bile. And here we can see where the biocanaliculus uh, is and then going to the, to the bile duct. So this is staining for that. This is staining for uh, the biocanaliculus. You can see it's just everywhere. In contrast, this stains for the bile duct itself. And you see the bile duct is larger near the triad that, that we see. There's the uh, central vein right there. Uh, maybe that's the artery, but then there's the bile duct. That's part of it. 
and that's what we see in the in the triad uh, as you're going uh, blood's going through there it's being oxidated going through the central vein to be drained out now the the gallbladder and bile ducts we want to talk about their function uh, the bilirubin tract organization of it, epithelium and a little bit about the function of it so here's the stomach uh, and coming in from the liver you get the hepatic duct the common hepatic duct uh, and then you have a cystic duct a cystic duct uh, as we see right here here's a cystic duct it kind of has valves in it so you can regulate uh, the contraction of the gallbladder uh, to discharge so you have a fatty meal you discharge more otherwise you're just uh, making bile at a fairly steady rate it's stored there until a fatty meal is needed if you remove the gallbladder then it's more difficult in digesting a fatty meal you have to not have so much fat so here we have uh, the portal vein uh, and this is a common um, common bile duct that we see and the cystic duct that we see there so if we look at the surface of it you can see it's either kind of when it's empty it's like this uh, or maybe uh, somewhat stretched out uh, whenever it is full and so we see these projections in through there and they have epithelium on the surface and they have spoon muscle so it can contract to squeeze out we look at that again it's simple columnar epithelium and you see at the base of them is kind of open up through there and that's so that it can concentrate it can pump out electrolytes and pull out the fluid uh, and so that will concentrate so the gallbladder concentrates the bowel that's in through there outside there we have the serosa with the mesothelium uh, on the on the outside so here we see a simple columnar epithelium with spaces at the bottom because it's going to be pumping fluid out there's lots of plasma cells to produce antibodies for transcytosis to be able to get uh, again to get antibodies into the bile itself and so here we have the portal vein this is a, a common abatic uh, bile duct and this is a cystic duct with a little valve that regulates fluid coming out of through there now here you can see the simple columnar epithelium with the opening in through there when it's really pumping fluid it comes out through here and here we can see what happened is you have junctions in through here and spaces open out through there so uh, sodium is being pumped out and that pulls the water out and that's how you reduce uh, the amount of bile of fluid uh, in the bile itself so we have distinguishing features of the mucosa uh, along the way uh, the cardiac stomach, uh, you have uh, glands, uh, the fundic sto st stomach, uh, you have the prior chief cells, the pleuric, another mucous glands like you have in the cardiac, it's a mucous gland, mucous gland, uh, fundic glands. You have the intestines, uh, you have the pennant cells, intestinal absorption cells, you have goblet cells, and in the gallbladder we have simple columnar epithelium with uh, capability of pumping uh, fluid uh, out the bottom of these individual cells. Next, we have the salivary gland, uh, and the functional unit is the asinus. So the asinus can be serous, which is um, uh, more proteinaceous. It could be mucus, or it could be mixed. All depend upon uh, the salivary gland, the location of those glands. Here we can see the glands here in this dog and this human. You can see the glands here. Uh, the origin is from the ectoderm, the oral ectoderm, but the GI tract usually come from the endoderm, as you see. Unfortunately, this guy with uh, body whirls had his chin replaced, as we can see. Salivary glands prevent uh, infections. How? They secrete IgA. Here we see IgA going through transcytosis with plasma cells in through here, making antibodies that goes up through there. As we see, uh, it also uh, produces lactoform, which binds iron. Uh, iron is needed for bacteria division to occur, so it binds up uh, their capability to divide. It uh, contains a lysosome, which kills bacteria, and it constantly washes in the mouth to dislodge uh, sweet bacteria down the GI tract to be digested. So here we see the salivary. Uh, glands as we see 
uh, uh, they have these myoepithelial cells that contract uh, and squeeze the secretions out. Uh, and also they have the special duct, the striated duct. Here we can see it striated because the mitochondria are lined up at the base due to the infolding uh, of the plasma membrane. The infolding of the plasma membrane amplifies the surface area and allows it to pump out uh, the electrolytes so you can produce a hypotonic uh, saliva. So you want it to be hypotonic. So it produces isotonic and then it pumps the salt out and it becomes hypotonic to mix with food stuff. And so you can see the ones that are mucus, flattened mucus at the bottom, finally flocculent stuff in the secretion, as opposed to cirrus. Cirrus is more dark, more red, uh, reddish than pale, uh, and spherical nuclei and not necessarily on the base. So those are just some characteristics. And sometimes you have the cirrus on the outside and the mucus on the inside, and that all goes in through the same opening, and that's a serous demilum, as we can see. So the salivary gland, they have intercalated duct. That's the first duct after the secretory unit. That's the intercalated duct. That's this guy right here. Very small cuboidal cells. Then we have the striated ducts with the striations in there. Uh, and here we can see uh, the striated ducts. We see the mitochondria lined up, and they're lined up because the plasma membrane is enfolded. And when it enfolds in like that, it lines up the mitochondria perpendicular to the base of the cell, and that gives you the striations that you see. So this is the striations that we're seeing are really the lining up of the mitochondria that's there. Now, uh, why do you have a striated duct? And that is to produce a hypotonic solution. So if you look at the fluid, uh, the sodium level or the osmoality, See, it's 150, uh, it's, it's around 300 milliosmos in the beginning, and then it goes to 180. So it pumps the salt out. So if you measure these at different parts, this is a secretory unit, that would be isotonic. And then as you come in through there and finally measure this one, you can see it's, it's lower because of these striated uh, duct cells uh, pumped out the salt and left the water behind. So here we can see the different cells. The secretory unit is the acids, could be mucus, could be serous. Intercalated duct is the first one, the striated duct, and then the excretory duct going outside. Uh, the, the cells, the astro, the astro cells that we see there has lots of smooth, a rough endoplasmic reticulum for protein secretion, especially if it's, if it's a serous type. And then the intercalated duct is a little bit pale, but the striated duct has a lining up of the mitochondria and the infolding of the uh, basal membrane uh, that, that you have there to amplify the surface area for pumping out. So in the glands we see, this is the striated ducts that we see there, see the striations of the mitochondria lined up. This is the basin, this is the lumen. And then these guys here, we see the intercalated duct that we see right there and there uh, that we can see. And then these are the asinine, which are the functional unit. There's another intercalated duct uh, going right through there. Then we have uh, the astos could be mucus or it could be serous. And sometimes you can have a serous demilune that we see. Serous is protonaceous, spherical nucleus, as I mentioned, as opposed to a flattened nucleus and a flocculent material for the mucus secretions. So here we see the striated ducts in through there. We see uh, different uh, lobes, lobules that we see. These are lobes in a lobule. Uh, and then uh, here we see the serous and the mucous secretions uh, that we see there, the intercalated ducts that we're going there. It goes from the asthmus to the striated duct. Uh, and then you have excretory ducts that's taking things outside. So here we see the salivary gland again. Uh, we can see mucus. Uh, and uh, serous secretions. We can see the striated ducts. There's some nerve in through there, and you can see the different lobules that are there. Here we can see uh, the serous demilume, as I mentioned, but even though it's secretions there, they go between adjacent cells. This is intercellular, intercellular cannuliculi again. Uh, that uh, it's a, like a little channel 
that takes these serous secretions that goes in through there. So with that, we come with the pancreas. The pancreas has both endocrine and exocrine function. Uh, uh, the acids is a functional unit for the uh, exocrine function, and it has ducts uh, that makes it exocrine. Endocrine, the islet salangohan is what they had, and of course, a diabetes is one of the problems that they could have. So here we see the pancreas. Sometimes uh, the pancreas may be two different units, but we have the different parts of the pancreas and it discharges uh, into the small intestines. So here we see the pancreatic uh, astral cell, like this is one cell here, kind of pyramid shaped, there's this nucleus, and then these are out at Shalangahan. There's also percentine corpuscles in there, not sure why it's in there, but it's there. So you said Alex Lauron, which has the alpha and beta cells that produce insulin and glucagon. And then you see the beginning of the ducts. Um, uh, the ducts in through there, this, this would be the, uh, the asini with the secretion that we see um, going toward the lumen. Here we can see those, so this would be secretions. And sometimes you, you start the duct within the acids itself. And these are central astral cells, so these are the starting of a duct. So this is one pyramid cell, shaped cell here, secretions, a lot of rough in the plaster, take them down here, secretions going out through there to be discharged uh, into the duct itself. So here we see the central astral cells, which is actually the beginning of a duct, where these are the secretory part of the astral cells themselves. So the central astral cells here are the starting of the duct, and then these are the astral cells that secrete. The zymogen granules, which are the secretions of it. So uh, here we see the pancreas, the intercalated duct. We see the, uh, the acids. There's one here and there's another one there. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we can see the different uh, components of the, the exocrine. Uh, function of the uh, the pancreas. There's also intercom function, the islet salangahan. You can see they're distributed throughout uh, there, uh, there, and they're distributed throughout because there's a local connection, local portal system between uh, the islet salangahan and the and the uh, astral cells. So you need the islets distributed throughout the pancreas because insulin stimulates secretion of the astral cells and glucagon inhibits. So you have that local uh, stimulation and control. So we see an astral cell here, pyramid shape, a large nucleolus, big nucleus with a euchromatic nucleus, lots of rough and plastic, uh, secretory granules that are condensing, ultimately zymogenic granules to be discharged, uh, uh, junction between adjacent cells uh, holding a lumen uh, up to there and the central astral cell starting a duct as we see. So this is a nucleus, a nuclear envelope. Uh, it's a, the Golgi apparatus is giving a condensation for the secretions that are going ultimately to be discharged into the into the, the lumen. So in summary, uh, the salivary gland lubricates. It also secretes uh, juices uh, and liver stores. Uh, and they produce antibodies to help maintain a normal milieu of the body even though you're exposed to uh, toxins and pathogens uh, in the environment whenever you eat. So in terms of the whole GI tract, we talked about the lips uh, and the teeth for um, uh, munification of the food, uh, and then uh, the salivary glands, uh, we see the glands that are in the stomach with the parietal cells and the chief cells, surface mucus cells, different cells. Here we see the surface mucus cells, uh, the mucus neck cells, and the parietal and chief cells that are located here. We can see the chief cells, the flocculent stuff that's inside there. Come on down to the intestines. Uh, we see the submucosal plexus, it's a micellar plexus of the submucosa. Uh, here's the submucosa here. We see the pennant cells, uh, we can see the intestinal absorptive cells and goblet cells in the intestine. The goblet cells, uh, a brush border, a lots of mitochondria for uh, uh, pumping uh, of, uh, a 
electrolytes uh, as well as salts in through there. We had some Peyer's patches, uh, lymphoidal tissue that's associated with the, the GI tract, the penance cells that kill bacteria that go down to the bottom of the crypts. We have the inner endocrine cells uh, that communicate with different parts of the digestive tract. So if we come to the digestive tract, we can see these uh, um, these long uh, villi that's projecting in through there. So intestinal villi are really from the small intestines. You don't see those in the large intestines. Um, and, and then you have uh, Brunner's glands, uh, submucosal glands, and a duodenum, uh, and and then just different uh, characteristics as you go down the GI tract. Also, uh, uh, there's a host of enzymes. You have the pancreatic juices. You have the bile for emulsifying fats, lipases, amylases, tripases to break down amino acids, which are absorbed right in through there on the surface of the cells, which you have intestinal absorption cells, some of those have enzymes that are right there to break amino acids down that can come through and get into the bloodstream, go through the portal vein, uh, and uh, get stored in the liver or detoxified in the liver. And then the fats go through the central lacteal, and that goes right into the bloodstream. Uh, that's why f a fat uh, soluble toxins is more toxic than a regular toxin. Uh, as we go to the other end, the anal opening, uh, we see this is the colon here, the rich colon with lots of, of um, goblet cells, and then we pick up skin uh, as you get to the anal opening. So in the liver, uh, we saw the dryad. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, you also have lymphatics and nerves in through there. But the three main things is the portal vein, uh, the artery, as well as the, as the bowel duct. So we want to thank the host of books that have contributed different pictures uh, to these things, Body Worlds, uh, for their contribution as well. So we have some questions here um, uh, that might be useful to, to observe. And so, again, we thank Body Worlds for uh, their beautiful pictures and all the dissection and work that they did to produce those. Uh, this is uh, Horse Tooth Reservoir in Colorado. This is Fort Collins, Colorado, and then this is the, the Rocky Mountain uh, National Forest that we see there. Uh, there I am uh, at Silverton, Colorado, and there's uh, ski slopes in through there. We went there and got there at uh, about midnight. I was so happy to see Silverton uh, that time. So we want to uh, thank you for your attention. Hope it's useful. If you do, please share it with your neighbor. Thank you.